up, my friends? Uh, welcome to Everything's Relative with Eve Sturgis. Thanks for being here with me. I'm Eve. As I explore all the ways that DNA testing is changing our lives, as uh, people discover all sorts of things about their own identities or the identities of people around them, it happened to me, it may have happened to you, or someone you love. If you think that it's a far distant reality from where you're sitting, I'm here to tell you that you're wrong. It's everywhere, even if it's not you. Uh, don't believe me? Just keep listening to this podcast. Download some more episodes. <laughs> um, so this week, before I talk about this week, I should tell you what happened last week. Last week, my friend Megan tagged me in a post on social media that was made by NPR. That's National Public Radio about this new book that's just come out that everybody's talking about called Normal Family on Truth, Love, and How I Met My 35 Siblings. Obviously, that is a book that belongs in the MPE library collection, and author Krista Bilton is obviously one of us. So I shot her a message, and the last thing I expected to happen happened, which is that she wrote right back. Um, so the next thing I know, we're chatting it up on a Friday morning. That's our episode today. It all happened so fast that I didn't even have a time or a chance to read her book, but she handled it effortlessly. <laughs> Here's what we'll do. I will not tell you what we talk about. I will just play it. So I'll play it and then you can hear it. Duh. Um, that's what you're here for. All right. Thanks so much for being here. I'll talk to you on the other side. feels like I should tell you just off the top that because this all happened so fast from when the NPR article got posted and then people started sending it to me and then I reached out to you, uh, have not read your book. <laughs> all good. <laughs> I was like, oh, what if that really upsets her? And she's like, I'm off. Um, no, totally good. As long as you yeah. just say amazing things about it, like it's the best thing you've ever read. And yeah, uh, totally. It's the best. It is. It's the best. Your thing mom is a character. It's such a page turner. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to see the movie. Yeah, there you go. Uh huh. Totally. Um, well, I'm sure all those things are true. And um, co total coincidence, because he and I haven't haven't connected about it at all. But I am friends with Don Anderson, who does another podcast called Missing Pieces and PE Life. And he read your book and he is just feeling so inspired and he loves it and he's posting and he's talking about it. But I do want to read what he, he just posted on um, Instagram because I did take a screenshot for this very day. I took a screenshot. Oh, cute. Um, but he said, he said, um, my favorite genre of books are stories of people who had crazier childhoods than mine. And this book is just that. It's amazing. I'd put it up there with The Glass Castle and The Liar's Club. And if you knew how much I love those books, you'd know what praise I'm giving. Thank you, Krista Bilton, for writing such an honest account of your childhood. Absolutely brilliant. Oh, yeah, I saw that. Those are two big, beautiful memoirs that I, you know, memoirists who I admire deeply. So you know, hearing, hearing one reader think that made my day for sure. So yeah, that is high praise. That's um, high praise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm so proud to say I've read both of those <laughs> <laughs> for someone who just only because I, I don't get to read a lot. I do a lot of recreational reading. Um, yeah. but I have read those two, um, somewhat recently. So I, I feel excited to dive into yours. Oh, nice. So Assuming I know nothing about you, yeah, like my listeners might not know anything about you. Mm. Have you always been a writer? No, I haven't. I've always wanted to write. So for all of those out there listening who secretly dream of writing a book one day, you know, I'm 37 and this is my first published work. Um, I think because... Um, it took me a long time to write this story. I've, I've been trying in different ways since I was 17 and I felt compelled to write it, but for various reasons, I just could not, um, I just could not get it out until now. And I'm glad ultimately that that's the case. Cause I have a lot of life experience behind me now and I've healed a lot. And I think that had I written this book at the time when I started trying to, it, it wouldn't be nearly as, um, coming from a place of, of healing and 
you know, I, I think that's important. I, I would probably not be very proud if it was filled with resentment and anger, you know? So, um, so yeah, so this is my first published work I did. I, uh, you know, I grew up with, I mean, we'll get into that later, but uh, very up and down economic circumstances. So even though I had these artistic ambitions, um, finding financial security was very important to me. So I went on a completely different career path in an area I perhaps wasn't deeply passionate about, but, um, but to just try and get some stable footing underneath me before I went and tried to Right. Because, you know, a, a, an artist's life is not necessarily a very fruitful one financially. And uh, I do know that. I do know that. <laughs> I'm very aware of that. But, uh, you know, I, yeah, I, I remember in college, you know, I was very interested in psychology. And I think in Psych 101, they brought out um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And it's this this inverted triangle where, you know, they have all the, they have these rows of here are your basic needs like food and water and shelter. And above that, here are some psychological needs like, you know, friendship and love and, you know, and then I was like, Oh, I don't have any. And then very, very tippy top is self-actualization and art and all this. And I was like, I keep trying to jump to the top, but I don't have any of the rungs of this pyramid. So maybe I should just try and like, you know, get some basic stability underneath me and, and then I can focus on that later. So I think that was my approach to writing. And yeah. I love, I feel like that's an extremely, ex I feel like that's an extremely grounded approach to life. And probably a lot of people wish more college students would have that realization <laughs> about yeah. um, how they could, how they could approach their passions. It's not to say that that didn't bring me a lot of angst throughout the years of feeling like, oh, I'm just never going to do the thing that I really want to do. And, you know, but looking back, maybe there's a reason for those struggles, even if at the time it feels so frustrating that you can't, you can't make it all happen. Right. Sure. A reason and, and reality. Um, so let's, okay, so let's pretend that, that um, I haven't read anything about your book at all, even about it. And you're going to give me your elevator pitch. What do you say it's about? Yeah. So, so the book, there are two stories and then they're sort of woven together. So the one, the one piece of the story um, is that in my mid twenties, I discovered that my father who has struggled with some mental health stuff and homelessness um, I discovered that he, after I was born, secretly became one of the most prolific sperm donors at the California Cryobank, which meant that I had anywhere between several dozen and possibly hundreds of biological siblings growing up all over the U.S. One of one, and the only reason I, and it's a long story how I discovered this, but the inciting incident for disc, for it, it being told to me by my mother, long story again, is that I was unknowingly dating a boy who was most likely my half brother. So there's that. That's one piece of the book. But then what? I mean, all, it's like, okay, good. All right. You're in. You're published. <laughs> like, okay, I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> I got to yeah. hear the rest of it. You had me at my half brother. Okay. So, so the, then the, you know, the, the heart of the story and the core of the story is that learning this made me realize that much of what I had been told by my mother about my conception, my dad, our family was a lie or, you know, or she would call it a fib because that was her, her tender mm. word for bending the truth. But it turned out a lot of what I had been told about our family was not true. And so it set me off on this mission to figure out what really happened. And, and so the book is really about growing up with my out there, magnificent, complicated gay mother in the 80s and 90s. Um, who struggled with alcoholism and addiction issues, who, um, 
you know, she was a leader in various cults and pyramid schemes. So we lived this very high, low life where sometimes we were living in these multimillion dollar mansions with a zoo filled with animals because she loved to spend when she was making money and high on life. And then, you know, other times we were being evicted and hiding under tables from landlords and um, on the, you know, living with friends in their little guest houses or in an empty office building. And so my life, my, and then in addition, because my mother had um, trouble with monogamy, she had a lot of different girlfriends. So my concept of family growing up was ever changing. Not only was our, you know, not only was our house coming and going and uh, but also we had all these mother figures that would come in for a few years and they would become mommy sable or mommy fay and sometimes they had kids of their own and those would be our step siblings and those would be so i'd come to know these people as our my brothers and sisters and then a big breakup would happen and i'd never see those people again so what family meant to me was already very complicated by the time i was 22 and discovered this biological family um so the heart of the book is really what is family and how do you how do you reckon with a complex family? Because I think even though even though parts of this story are extraordinary and unusual, there's stuff in there that is universal. Um, and so yeah, that's it's a lot, <laughs> but that that's sort of the story. Wow. All right. Yeah. Now I now I'm understanding um, the glass castle and the. Liars Club reference that Dawn made um, so much of the high low chaos mm -hmm. of, of eccentric parents. Um, yeah, and then the, also the the you know having the um, having mental health issues mm -hmm. with both parents mm -hmm. having addiction. It turned out there was a secret history of like suicide in my mom's family that I didn't know about. So um, yeah, just the. Yeah, how we, how we come to terms with with a complex family, and then now in the age of twenty three and Me and Ancestry dot com, people are discovering that their families are even more complex than they knew, and some people are discovering that they have a they had a sperm donor father and they didn't know, or that they were adopted and they you know, or all kinds of things are coming out. So that piece of the story, I think, is is also about this new kind of family that's emerging, and is it family when it's biology and so those are some additional questions that that I asked in in the book. So, since that's sort of my my world, my community is in that those those people that have these surprise discoveries, mostly due to to DNA testing. Um, what has well, I guess really what I'm thinking about is how it's such an interesting time for your book to come out because this is becoming a bigger and bigger conversation. So it also feels you said that you needed to have a life and heal and get through some things for the timing of the book to make sense. And also this world is, is um, emerging, right. Of all these people. So what has the reception been like? It's been so, it's been wonderful. You know, I, um, for so long, I was just struggling over the writing of the book. And I, I don't think I gave a lot of thought to what it would be like to put it out into the world. And um, But I did have this intuition that people would relate to parts of the story that I myself didn't even predict. And so hearing from readers, you know, mostly via Instagram messages, actually, but some over email, um, it's just it's just so wonderful to, to know that the, the things that I wrote about where I was really vulnerable and, you know, put aside my shame about the things that made my family not a typical or slash, you know, normal, quote unquote, family, um, that these are questions that or th struggles people are going through, too, and, and that we can all be in it together and, and processing it together. And um, because when I first discovered, you know, all these biological siblings, it it was, I thought it was this dark, heavy thing. And it was really painful for me to hear about it. And, you know, when they started meeting on Facebook or reaching out to me, I wanted nothing to do with them. I had this huge panic attack. I was like, biology doesn't make family. And um, I think a piece of that was just because family was already so complicated for me. And so the idea of like one new family member, let alone, you know, 
dozens, possibly hundreds. It's like, how do you even, how, how do you even psychologically process that? So I think that was part of it. I think it was also because my mom saw it in such a negative way. And I think as kids, especially as someone who parented my mother and cared a lot about her feelings about things, I think I also in a way adopted her, uh, her attitude. And she thought, oh, this is such a weird thing. This is so different. And I was just like, you're right. That's how it is. And so the book is also my process of changing my mind completely on that. And, and now I see it as this beautiful, positive, sweet thing that is such an, such an enhancement to my life. And so the book is also about that journey and, and what changed for me. Um, and I know that's not unique to my story because I've heard from so many people that are like, I discovered I have a donor and I have this big family. And, you know, especially for the ones who didn't, who were lied to and, and never told they had a biological, uh, a different biological father. I think that there's a, there seems to be a lot of hurt over that lie. And so, and I can relate to that. I think just knowing the truth is such a, even if the truth is painful, the truth is ultimately you need to know the truth. Right. Yeah. yeah. Ultimately you need to know the truth. I mean, that's sort of the, it just keeps coming down to that over and over yeah. again with it, within the community, within the DNA discovery community. Um, yeah. I imagine that people, depending on where they are in the journey, relate to your book in different ways at different times. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's people that are like, yeah, it is really weird. <laughs> I'm glad that you were again, you know, it was really weird for you in the beginning. Um, and then and then perhaps their their hearts are opened by your own transformation. Um, and then people that have gone all the way through it relate relate to your whole journey. Um, so has there been a difference in feedback or reception from, let's say, let's call them the the regular world, like the casual, the casual reader who is not, <laughs> I don't know what they're called. Has there been a different reception for people that relate to it really explicitly versus the donor conceived? People? I think the thing that's been surprising, you know, maybe, maybe memoir is a genre where it sort of meets its, um, its perfect match. Like the people that are drawn to memoir as a genre tend to self-select for, you know, this type of stuff, but I, you know, there are different categories of readers. So I've had like LGBTQ readers that are really vibing with it. Like, because my mom's story in a way is like, she was, you know, she was a lesbian growing up in the fifties and sixties at a time when she, when she realized that she had feelings for women, she thought she was the only person in the world that had feelings for the same sex. She didn't even know the word lesbian existed. She didn't have the language to describe what she was. And the only, like the only time she watched a movie called the children's hour, I think that's the name of the movie. And that was the first depiction she'd ever seen of anyone having gay feelings on TV. And that ends with a suicide by the woman who feel, has those feelings. I mean, this was a really heavy time. And then when my mom decided she wanted a family in the early eighties, she was the first woman she knew who the first gay person she knew to set out to have a family. So, um, so I think as much as she becomes a complex character throughout the book, I've had a whole set of readers who um, relate to her journey and the shame she had around her sexuality or having to, or trying to start a family when it's more complicated than for, you know, a heterosexual person or, or single moms by choice who aren't gay, but are going through that. So, I've had those group of readers. I've also had um, a ton of readers from the community that, that you're a part of who, right. as you said, are at different stages of the journey. I've had a ton of readers who grew up with um, alcoholic or addict parents or in dysfunctional homes. And so you have this whole other population of people, readers that want to, especially from the LGBTQ community that want to... Um, or relate to or are interested in like her history as sort of a pioneer in her time, right? Yes, that's right. I also have readers that cross all three of those, like someone who identifies as LGBTQ, who grew up in a crazy family and who realized they have a donor or, you know, so yeah. I think I think the power of storytelling and especially memoir as a genre is that like you know, I've gotten over my shame and I'm telling my true story. And 
as much as there are parts of it that people can't relate to, there, there are a lot of the feelings that are the same and how, you know, that I think that hopefully helps other people to, to open up about what they're going through in a way that is not filled with shame. And, um, and yeah, that, that, that's why I love memoir. And, and that's what I hope the book does for other people is, is just, you know, it's just my individual story, but there's a lot that other people can relate to. And it's also really funny too. It's not, it's not this dark. <laughs> Cause there is a lot of humor in, in all of this. And um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, if you can't find humor in the chaos, you'll just drown. So, so you, so it's a survival, survival tactic. Um, I'm excited to, I'm excited to read it. What do you feel like, do you feel like there was something that, anything that was the biggest surprise for you um, in the writing process? Yeah, there were a few things. Um, there were a few things. So, so the origin story of how I came to be, which I discovered in reporting out the book, but also when, when this original discovery of my father's donations um, came through is so, so as I said, my mom was this gay woman in the eighties who wanted to have a kid. And so she went on a manhunt and the and my father walked into a hair salon and he was the most handsome stranger she'd ever seen and she looked at him and she said oh this is going to be the one this is going to be the man that i take out to lunch and offer two thousand dollars to to give me his sperm so i can get pregnant with a turkey baster and that's exactly what happened and she really nailed it she nailed it yeah and then she so i'm the first kid of my father's children and then she took him to the California cryobank to get tested for STDs. And that is how he was introduced to this career. But before taking him to the cryobank, she sat him down and made him swear that he would never donate sperm to anyone but her. And then... <laughs> Uh, spoiler alert. Spoiler, <laughs> spoiler alert. alert. He, he did it for almost 10 years, three times a week. So... But, but then she felt really guilty and really ashamed of not giving us a traditional family. So she then paid him to be in our lives as dad. Mm -hmm. So I knew him not as a sperm donor, but as my father, who was eccentric and not around that often, but who was there. And, uh, and so I think the, so the most surprising thing in reporting out the book was when I, when I started talking to him about his visits and he explained to me that my mother had paid him for those visits. And so I was suddenly in this murky territory of, oh, so not only was I, I thought that they were best friends who had had a kid together. That was the story I had been told. And so suddenly I was like, is, was my dad a sperm donor and a father for hire? Was he actually my dad? Did he love me? Um, and so that was a really challenging thing to discover while writing the book. Um, <laughs> my mind is just blown right now with, with not with the surprise of, of the scenario, although that is all very shocking, but to imagine if that's what happened, like, I try to explain this. I mean, I think I think DNA discovery surprise people understand this. I think you'll understand this. But if that's possible, then anything is possible. And so there's a mind blowing experience of any. It, I don't know. It just gets. It just expands and expands and expands with possibility. If 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 one part of the story isn't true, then all of it isn't true, and then. And not to even mention, I mean, forget about true or false. That doesn't even start to explore that you're like psychological experience of finding out that your father was being paid to hang out with you or drop by or whatever, you know, like it just, I mean, that is layered. It's layered <laughs> as are these other DNA discoveries. Yeah. Because suddenly, yeah. And then, and then the nature nurture component of it all is also, bizarre and interesting. And, you know, there's, there's some heavy stuff in there. My father was diagnosed with schizophrenia 
Um, whether that's what he has or some form of bipolar, I, you know, I'm not a doctor, I don't know, but, um, but you know, there, there are several siblings who struggle with mental health stuff. And so, you know, sometimes that material can be challenging to deal with, but I think you're so much more prepared to deal with it if you know your biological history than if you don't. Um, and... And there are so many silver linings too. So there are plenty of kids who don't struggle with this stuff. Um, I'm not. I'm not discounting how hard it is for the ones that do. But um, you know, there's also there was one woman who discovered my father that she had a donor that it was my dad, and that um, and but she her whole life she had been raised by this man who died prematurely, and she thought that she had this really heavy genetic health history that meant that she was going to live like live a very short life and that she would die early. And then she found out that she had a donor and she's like, ah, who cares about his mental health stuff? I've been on pills for bipolar forever. Now I know I get to live a long, beautiful life. So there are many different perspectives on it too, you know? So, um, uh, yeah, again, not to discount there, there's heavy stuff in there and, and it's not to discount it, but, um, but as you said, it always comes down to the, the truth is always better, even if it's hard to deal with. And mm-hmm. um, and so even though I knew my dad and he wasn't an anonymous donor, there, there were so many lies growing up. And that universal feeling of what is the truth? What really did happen? And then you have a whole, then you have to deal with the truth and you have to process it. And, and, and that's a whole second piece, but you can't do that until you know what the real thing is. Right. Um, right. And then having compassion for our parents and, and why those lies were told. Is your mom alive? Yeah. And how's your relationship with her now? We have a great relationship now. You know, a lot of our struggles growing up were, were her drug addiction and alcoholism and she got sober. And, um, so that's a big deal. And, Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, somewhere in the book, I start to realize what her upbringing was like. And I don't think I ever truly understood that. And that, that allowed me to have so much more compassion for her. And, and, um, and so now we have a a beautiful relationship and and she's proud of the book, which is amazing because that took a a while. (laughs) Many threats and, you know, therapy sessions over whether I could publish this book, but now she's happy with it. So that's Mm -hmm. amazing. You said two things there, like compassion and history have so much to do with healing a relationship with someone, right? She didn't, she didn't just come out of a vacuum, you know, or the black hole as this person, like she how it all one thing always leads to another um i think i think that that is such an important part of people's yeah of of healing relationships with people i wish we could sort of maybe maybe we can maybe you just did it maybe you just broke it down into two the two factors that that are really necessary that you know compassion and history are so important which is which lends itself to why history is so important um But you have to understand too, like all of us coming of age right now who had these genetic secrets, like our parents were the first ones doing it. And there was no playbook for how to do it correctly. And there was a lot of often shame in having to do it differently than the people around them. And um, so it's, it's different now. And we get to, we get to talk about it and change it for the next generation. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be so interesting to see how how it changes and how it evolves. Like I would love I wish I could time travel to 100 years from now and just sort of see what what it's like and how it's changed to read a read a timeline. Shame is always where the secrets come from. Right? And uh, I'm so interested in everybody's surprise stories, but I'm deeply interested in the role that culture and society and rules and shame have in the development of of this phenomenon. Me too. Yeah. Cause I think it all does come to that, to shame a, a lot of it. Right. It all comes down to it always. Yeah. And often we, and then processing our own shame that we're carrying around. Cause I had a ton of it growing up. Um, yeah. 
about our economic circumstances, about my mom being gay, about my different family, about my father's homelessness, um, about this larger biological family. And then but the problem with shame is then you have secrets and then you are presenting a different person to the outside world than you are on the inside. And then you can't really form deep relationships. Yeah. See, you just did it. You broke it down. <laughs> like, 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 and that's the problem, everybody. <laughs> so <laughs> there you that's, go. What we're, that's what we're trying to fix here. Right. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, what? So. So back, so, so wait, I have, my brain kind of went in like 14 different directions right now. One, where are you? Are you in New York, LA? I'm in LA. Where in LA? Not, you don't have to give me an address, but just give me like. I'm in West Hollywood. Okay. I'm over on the East side in the Eagle Rock area. Oh, nice. Have you always, have you stayed in the LA area always? Cause you grew up up here, down here, right? I grew up here all over. We moved a lot every couple of years, but all over LA. And then um, like from the depths of the valley to the west side to the east side, all over. But, um, but then, uh, then I went to college in New York and then, I, and then I moved to Europe for a little bit and then, and then I moved back here. Another crazy surprise in the story is that I went to this tiny art school in Italy for Renaissance painting, which as you know, is not is super in vogue in terms of painting style these days. And, <laughs> right, that's and, a niche. It's a niche, a really small niche. And no one has ever heard of this school. Uh, it's very tiny. And mostly Europeans go there. It's like 30 kids a year or something, something. I mean, really small. And one of my biological half siblings went to the school the year I left. Whoa. Yeah. What? Yeah. So you didn't, you weren't there together, but you just like, just we missed each other, like sliding doors. And so like and the you, school in Florence, Italy, mm -hmm. she grew up in upstate New York across the country with, you know, two heterosexual parents in a very sort of stable, stereotypical family situation. And yet we both wound up with this obscure interest such that we both went to this tiny art school in Italy to learn it. That's amazing. So in terms of nature nurture, it's mind blowing, actually. What do you hope happens with this book? I hope it touches people and that people relate to it and they feel less alone. Uh, yeah, that's what I hope. Um, mm -hmm. In the same way that the memoirs that I read along the way helped me to process things and feel less alone. Um, and I hope they just enjoy reading it. It's it's a fun it's a fun story. I worked I worked really hard on making it a page turner because it certainly felt like a page turner to live it. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I never knew what was going to happen from one minute to the next, and and I tried to infuse the book with that. So it's a fun read. Um, it's a quick read. I've heard from a lot of people they read it in a day or two. Um, and yeah, I, I just hope that. I hope it reaches people that, that need to read the story at that moment for whatever reason. Yeah, that's really wonderful. I hope so too. Um, and are you going to continue writing? Is, is, yes. this the beginning of a, is this the beginning or a beginning or a part of a, of a new career for you? I hope, I hope so. Yeah. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm enjoying having this one out in the world and so I'm not, in a rush to figure out what the next thing is, but I have a couple, I have a couple ideas that I've been noodling on. So at some point, yeah, I'll probably do another book um, or, or maybe some other formats. I can't wait. I can't wait for all of it. And I can't wait to read your writing as well. Oh, well. <laughs> it's, it's fine. Um, is there anything that you feel like is a really good interview question that I did not ask that everyone else has asked you that I'm supposed to ask you? I don't think so. Want, or anything no, you want, anything you, really, you wanted to talk about that I never no. like offered you a good segue. No, I think I think I think that's it. It's it's this story about nature and nurture, and like we all grew up in in a specific family with its own specific dynamics, and then discovered 
this other additional piece. And so a lot of the book is my specific family I grew up in, and then it's the additional piece as well. And uh, I just love hearing other people's stories. You know, read it, reach out to me and tell me yours. I, I love, it's so wonderful to connect with, with other people who have been through some of this stuff. And it's, it's high drama. You can't make this stuff, you know, each, every individual story is just a novel or a book unto itself. And so I can, I'm sure there are going to be more stories like this that come out. Yeah. It's so interesting how things store, you know, stories, events, experiences are totally unique, which is what makes it interesting. And yet simultaneously, uh, universal. Right. Which I guess is was what makes it a good, you know, what makes it a good story. But the ability to hold both those realities is perhaps the job of the writer um, to, to be able to, to find the balance in those things. Um, totally. It sounds like you did it. Sounds like you did it beautifully. Oh, I can't, I can't wait to read it. Oh, I can't. I can't wait to talk to you after I do. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Eve. This is so lovely. My pleasure. I thank you for just rolling with it. The audiobook is great. Maybe that's something to end with. Oh, the audiobook is great. Is that what you said? Yeah, the audiobook's fun. I narrated it, which was something that I did not want to do when they asked me. And um and I I fought back pretty hard on that cuz that, you know, no one likes the sound of their own voice or some people do, but I'm not one of them. But then they sent me three actors to listen to and you know, and it just wasn't it just wasn't me. And so I realized, okay, I'll, I'll read this because I, I can, I know the emotional tone of the different moments or I can, I can do my mom's voice, you know, as yeah. anyone do their own, their own parents. tone. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So I narrate the audio book and it's a lot of fun. So for, you know, for podcast listeners who like to listen, I highly recommend the audio book. Oh, exciting. Oh, that's great. That's cool. Okay. All right. Signing up right now. Perfect. I have a kitchen to clean. I have a kitchen to clean. So here we go. <laughs> Chapter one. We're going <laughs> to get to it. Awesome. Great. Well, let's definitely keep in touch. Have a wonderful day. Krista. You as well. Bye. Thanks. Hey. So as I was listening back to the conversation, I just had an idea. And I hope it makes sense to you, my listeners. Let's do Krista's book for the next book club read. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, this summer I somewhat spontaneously hosted a one-time like book club event on Zoom for anyone who wanted to join us. Uh, super fun time. And while I can't and won't make any promises that this will be a regular thing, let's definitely do it again with Krista's book. So I will put that on Instagram soon and send out a newsletter, which begs the question, are you following this podcast on social media to keep your finger on the pulse of all that's all the haps? Um, at Everything's Relative Podcast is where you'll find me on Instagram and Facebook. If you're not a social media person and would rather get a newsletter email every once in a while, and when I say every once in a while, I mean every once in a while, nothing regular, I promise, I swear, head over to the website. So you sign up. Everything's Relative Podcast.com is where you'll find that. Um, if you are getting anything out of this podcast experience and you want to support my endeavors, that is so awesome and appreciated. The easiest way is to write a quick review and give a star rating on whatever platform you're listening on. Uh, you could also support me with Patreon, find the link on my socials and website to throw a buck or two my way. Um, and I'm pretty excited because the newest way to support Everything's Relative podcast is to get yourself something fun that sparks conversation for the people around you. Go on over, check out the new t-shirts that I designed, or get a lapel pin to wear on your blazer to your next business casual event. All those are available on the website. However you support me, please know that I am forever grateful. Um, there have been a few negative comments lately, and I hope you believe me when I say that all I want is to talk about DNA discoveries and raise awareness. Thank you to everyone who has helped make that happen. I'll be back next week. I'm Eve Sturgis. Please don't forget to wear your sunscreen and keep an eye out for the book club information. Thanks so much, Krista Belton, again for your book, Normal Family. Bye-bye, everybody. 
Everything's Relative with Eve Sturgis is produced by Eve Sturgis and Kaylin Egan and edited by Joy Rumor. Logo designed by Ivy McNally and music is used with permission from Goodbye the Band. Eve is a licensed psychotherapist, but her podcast episodes are not therapy sessions. Thank you.